need the tools. And furthermore, their self-esteem is bound around avoiding being responsible because once you're responsible in a family, you're responsible for everything. So responsibility becomes dangerous to carry. We could carry on that conversation in so many interesting strands where that will lead. I've really enjoyed what you've been saying. Um, I think this is a very deep issue myself um, because it's wrong. The lack of um, responsibility, if you like, and the learned behaviour is right throughout our helping professions in a way. A lot of the work that many of us do is informed by the, the illness model, for instance, which actually likes to um, encourage people to deny their emotions very often. Um, so not only do we invite our um, clients to suppress their emotion and not take responsibility for it, but we actually also do that in our organisations. And our organisations, um, we're, we're almost, off, many of us are in the position of looking after the life of the organisation and the life of our position. So we maintain this place where we don't engage with dealing with the emotion appropriately and people withdraw and or they behave inappropriately. It's just a lot in there as well. I guess that what interests me is in which direction does the emotional vein flow? Because I would argue that it flows at least as powerfully outward from the organisation to us as from us to them. Yeah. And that if we're not careful, the helping professions are overly scripted to have the carer role. And I think that in the long term, if we don't get some respite from that, it becomes increasingly harder for us to visit the person who needs something role, because it's been such a long time since that's been visited. And I think we have to really think hard about how an association like this, mentoring, action learning, supervisory networks, can ensure we stay in balance. And I, a nurse said to me many years ago, because nurses are very practical, and she gave me this great piece of advice. She said, everybody needs these three roles in their professional life. Somebody to scratch your brain, somebody to kick your butt, and a shoulder to cry on. I thought that was great advice. And none of us should be doing what we are doing if those three roles don't exist in our social professional network. They may not all exist in the person of a supervisor. But I think we have to, we have to make sure they're there. And the irony is that might mean that we have to take responsibility sometimes for saying, I'll go and get that, I'll have a peer mentoring, or I'll be in an action learning set. But I do worry about what happens to helpers when, when the preferred and conferred identity is only to be the helper, and that we might lose track of our, what did we say? Our willingness to be in touch with our vulnerability. And I think we can only do that if we visit that, if we have a whole stack of 10 years of never visiting it, that gets scary to open the suitcase. And so I think social workers ought to have a real discipline about insisting that we are good help seekers as well as good help givers. Not in a, not in a dependent way, but I think help, good help seeking is the flip side of good help giving. My own belief is that people who no longer know how to help seek appropriately are going to run dry on help giving eventually. Couldn't agree more. It's a kind of two-sided coin, yeah. Tony, just uh, not so much a question, but a comment if I might, around the selection of staff. It seems to me you talk about skills and options. And, and yet often we select staff on technical sort of bits and pieces. Just, it's not a question as much, but a, a comment if I might um, around your thoughts around how we might do that differently or better. It's a great question. I think one of the, I mean, I'm, what I'm going to say, and then uh, what I'm going to say is I think there are some really good emerging recruitment approaches that will do that. But of course I'm going to say the recruitment approaches that are raising the threshold of what we want are in a context of not being able to get bums on seats. So uh, I am going to... I am going to plead for best practice, but I'm very aware in England and probably here that we're often scraping just to get the position filled. There is a point at which it's not worth filling it. So, there's a wonderful... What we need to do is to stop answering questions that have a clear answer. 
We need to stop asking candidates questions for which there is a clear and correct technical answer. We need to start offering candidates questions for which there cannot be a single correct answer and which require them to do some on-the-spot cognitive, cognitive and moral and emotional reflecting. Let me give you an example. I am often asked to provide those kind of questions for recruitment panels. About, oh, about six weeks ago, somebody asked me for recruiting for social workers, and the question I came up with is ask the candidates what they do when they don't like their client. There is no right answer to that question. What you're looking for is the openness to engage with that as a real issue. The first three candidates reversed it and talked about when the client didn't like them. And we, we, we recognize why we might have done that. The next three just came alive. And what they demonstrated to the panel was, this is an important question. Yes, there are people I struggle with, and I worry about that. And, you know, I talk to my supervisor, I give some thought to that, and I wondered why it is. And if you think about the, particularly, the very difficult to talk about interfaces, the black-white interface in England, that becomes untalkable about if we don't license that form of inquiry. And the NSPCC, my previous agency, have now developed a really sophisticated, what's called values-based interviewing, which is um, a pre-technical interview one-hour set of questions where the candidate is informed. These are not questions about the technical knowledge, they're about your basis of values and boundaries. And there's a whole series of questions. I think one of the questions is, can you think of a time when uh, you've come close to crossing an ethical boundary? Talk to us about that. And the candidate who says, never, we all have come close. Somebody gave us a Christmas present. Somebody we were attracted to. Somebody we deliberately left out that little piece of information. We've all been close. And I think the trick, I think it's relatively easy to design the questions. What's tricky is to get the panel members to agree what a reflective answer looks like. Because I might say, that's very reflective. My colleague might say, oh, she's all over the place, all those feelings. <laughs> but I think we are moving towards the development of a robust form of HR practice. Absolutely. Now, most of that should do two things. It should screen out the people who shouldn't be looking after their cats. <laughs> but frankly, a half-decent technical interview should as well. What it is much more about is identifying potential capability of a new person coming in. What do we need to give this person to really help them be an effective worker? I have met a number of candidates who were interviewed under that and didn't get jobs. <laughs>